Hey everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me today. I look as though I've been out logging all morning, don't I? <laughs> in my dreams. Uh, today, I've got a bunch of vignettes, little snapshots based on current events, including the debt ceiling. I thought I'd take a look at that. Plus, George Santos's consciousness. I went into that to see how he was feeling on the inside and how he saw the world. That was really, really interesting. Plus, Merrick Garland and the Federalist Society. Several of you suggested that the Federalist Society might have its claws in Merrick Garland. And that's why Trump hasn't been indicted yet. Plus, New Zealand, the Prime Minister has resigned. What will happen now? I thought I'd take a look at that. Plus, Trump is at war with Ron DeSantis. Not the other way around. Trump has started a war because they're both running for president in 2024. And I thought I'd take a look at what was going to happen there. Plus, I will have the results, because I'm about to do it here, I will have the results of the Diet Coke consciousness experiment that I did a couple of weeks ago, plus a whole bunch more. Okay, so let's crack on with the debt ceiling crisis, another drama exacerbated by the far-right members of the GOP. Basically, the Treasury has certain obligations. It has to make sure that the US government pays interest on foreign debts. It has to make sure that the government pays social security checks. There are a lot of obligations and responsibilities that the far right are saying, look, I think we should default on this because we don't want any more debt accruing. But it's related to past obligations, not future ones. They don't seem to get that. Janet Yellen of the Treasury is warning that this could lead to a global financial meltdown. She can shunt things around. She can move the deadline to June and everything could be sorted out. But it's a shame that it has to happen in the first place. And I thought, let me take a look and see if I get any kind of pictures for the debt ceiling crisis. And what I did, I was looking up at the clouds. It was like massive cloud cover with a hole in it. A bit like the ozone layer hole, which is healing, by the way. Things are getting better there. But uh, it's like a big hole. And there was a lot of tension in this hole. It was like moving backwards and forwards, trying to close, and it couldn't quite close, and it sprang open, then it tried to close again and sprang open. This was the friction over the debt ceiling, the constant fight. Not just now, either. Probably into the future. This seemed to be an ongoing thing. There was an ever-opening, an ever-closing sphincter, and the tension was between the two directions. And I thought, maybe I can project forward and see what happens if I simply allow it to close. So I did. America defaults. People were going, why is this happening? What do we do now? This is terrible. This is bleak. We're lost. I can't see anything. That kind of panic. I say, don't invest energy in that kind of worry and fear, that kind of panic, because you draw those circumstances into your experience and you make them a reality. Even so, the reality is that if it's allowed to happen, if default happens... It could be catastrophic for America and the world global markets. Remember those pictures of the GOP where there was a waterfall and their little boat was heading towards it? The boat eventually went around the waterfall and didn't go over it, even though they were saying, hey, let's go over the waterfall. It could be really exciting. They eventually clung to the bank and went around. And I did get a feeling that this hole in the clouds wouldn't close. Not completely. It will be fine. There may be threats to it. There may be moments when people go, come on, let's do it, behind closed doors. But because it would destroy <laughs> global markets and stuff, they decided not to do it, I think. And in the other pictures, the boat went around the waterfall rather than over it. That's what happened. Uh, I also took a look at New Zealand because Jacinda Ardern, who's been Prime Minister there very successfully since 2017, has decided to step down. She is a bit of a hero. She managed to get New Zealand through the COVID crisis and uh, was admired the world over for the way she did that. 
but it meant that New Zealand stayed closed for a lot longer than the rest of the world. New Zealanders began to resent that. Her popularity started to wane. There were other issues too, but her popularity started to wane. And now she's in a position, perhaps for personal reasons too, that she's decided that she doesn't have the fuel in her tank to see it through to another election and is going to let somebody else have a go. I did her pictures quite a while ago, if you remember, and they showed her wading through a tunnel of grime. I don't even remember now what it was, but grime. And she came to an opening at the end and the grime all poured out. She went down with it and then was faced with either running away into freedom or embarking on another tunnel and tunnels of stress and worry and anxiety and whatever. And she stood there debating. And that's basically what's happened. She went along the tunnel of Merck, shot out the other end, and now has decided to uh, not embark on another season of high stress in trying to win an election. So I thought I'd take a look at New Zealand and see how things might go over the next year. And there was a hill, and extending from the hill were two very distinct promontories, one on this side, one on that side. I'm hoping these aren't on the nose, like that's left wing, that's right wing. But it could be Jacinda Ardern has been a pretty progressive prime minister. She moved to the centre more as she went along, but she's considered a progressive. Whereas her rival, Christopher Luxon, is a Christian conservative, anti-abortion, anti-marijuana legalisation and so on. And he and his national party must be rubbing their hands right now going, oh, this is our chance. We can take New Zealand to the right. So there were two promontories. I went down the left-hand one, and as far as I could tell, it was sunny to the end. So I came back, and I went along the other one, and the other one was, like, peaked slightly, and it was very, very easy to slip on it. It was like a waxed floor. You know, it's like, oh, oh, and you slide off because you can't get a grip. So it seemed as though a right-wing government might not be as successful as right-wing leaders hoped it would be, and that New Zealand would prosper by going down the left-hand side. It may not be liberal versus conservative. It might be something else. But on the basis of this, there were two distinct choices. And uh, New Zealand would be far better taking the left promontory, which led into sunlight and felt really, really good and stable and firm, and not choose to go down the way less stable right-hand promontory. And speaking of right-wing people who probably shouldn't be in power, let's take a look at George Santos. Everything that could be said about him has been said. Remember, I showed the plank of wood with him sawing through it, desperate to get where he needed to go. There was a plan, there was a scheme, and he was going to see this through no matter what. It has been suggested that he's doing this for free health care and the uh, pension that Congress people get. But certainly he had a plan. And it seemed like he was trying to complete this plan because he owed somebody something. And this circular saw kept on going, but eventually it ran up against a bar of steel and that bent and broke the teeth on his blade. And uh, that seemed to be the end for him. But what interested me was, what's going on inside of him? What does he see when he looks at the world and this tempest roaring around him? He can't be easy to be him. Not now this drag queen thing has surfaced as well. He obviously thinks, if I can just keep going, like that saw blade, keep going and get that pension and that health care and then honour my promises to the people who gave me money. I'm done. I'm home. I'm dry. So I thought I would go into his consciousness and see what I could see. There was George Santos. There's the shape, the outline of George Santos. That's him as we see him. But when I went into his consciousness, that's not what was actually happening on the inside. There didn't seem to be that big frame that we see. There was a tiny little person 
operating on different levels. It's like there were floors, like in a department store, there were floors that he could operate on. And he was running around on each floor. Got to do this, got to do that. Oh, got to pull this chain, got to move over there. As if there was a very, very complex machine and he was the one caretaker of it. The one guy who had to make it all work and keep it going. There were lever levers, as Americans say, levers, levers to pull and push. And he had to run up and down stairs and climb down ladders. And it was sort of panicky, but it was more about keeping yourself afloat and not allowing what was going on the outside to penetrate the inside. People go, well, does he have no shame? Is he not worried? Is he not fearful about his future, about going to prison, about fraud, being deported to Brazil for alleged crimes? He's not bothered. That's not an issue for him. His issue is, how do I keep this thing going? This little figure is just bothered about the mechanics. It's as if he's completely blocked off from any kind of objective reality because his subjective reality is so damaged. And his sole concern is uh, running around inside, repairing things. Now, the other day, I did a video, if you remember, about a rain walk. I often go out in the rain. People say, why? Why would you do that? Because I want to experience life and every aspect of it. One day I'll die and I won't get to walk out in the rain anymore. That's why. But um, I went out and I also felt the energy of the earth while I was there, if you remember. But several of you said, well, why didn't you test the rain itself? while you were out there, since you're testing water. I did, I collected some rain from that and I made a video almost immediately afterwards. We have the rainwater that is freshly collected from the storm and I thought I would test it live now and see what comes. So first of all, let's just get a grip on it in terms of the um, muscle testing. Um, let, me, let me just do my, give me a yes. Give me a no, there we go. So now, uh, you've got to do that every single time because the polarity can change. It used to be the opposite way for me originally. So now rainwater, let's just, I'm just gonna put my finger in it. There we go, okay. Now rainwater, uh, what do we think? Oh, incredibly strong. You see, I wouldn't have drunk rainwater. I just thought of acid rain and pollution in the atmosphere and every time they blow up a tank in Ukraine, I always imagine that smoke and everything going into the atmosphere and coming down as rain. Now let's do pictures for the energy and see what happens. This is so exciting. Yeah, it's like a, a very soft gray gauntlet fits onto my hand and then starts pulling me in. It's something elemental, clearly, because we are water, right? We are made of a certain high percentage of, of water. Maybe there is a unity there, um, a kind of benevolence of the elements that connects with the bene benevolence of the elements within us, and we unite at that point. I was astonished by that, the way the energy just clung to my arm. It was kind of reassuring also as well, that sort of sense of oneness. Now, as you know, I've said this many times, I get asked to do a lot of sets of pictures and I do way more than I tell you about. Some are boring, the results are boring, some I don't understand actually. Then there are the self-indulgent ones and they just make me think, ah, I'm not showing that. <laughs> that's, just, that's just not something that's very relevant. But I'm gonna show you one today because it keeps nagging at me. I've recorded this now, I think five times. I've put it in five separate videos and just taken it out each time, but today I'm gonna put it in. And uh, it concerns somebody who wrote to me several weeks ago now, maybe in November, about the Galaxy of Andromeda. And I gave this comment a thumbs up, sure. Uh, but in private, I was thinking, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing a galaxy, how do I do a galaxy? So I just dropped it. But what was fascinating was, you know I've had, this is the self-indulgent bit, you know I've had about three psychic readings from quite reputable readers over the past 
two years, three years, four years, something like that. And each one has said, oh, I uh, can't read you because you're an alien. Uh, and uh, they don't give you your money back at that point. They just say, you're an alien. I can't read you. Goodbye. And I have always dismissed that. That's just so silly. But then, after somebody had requested the Galaxy of Andromeda, another psychic wrote to me unsolicited and basically said, I believe that you are from another galaxy. And I wrote and said, okay, um, which galaxy are we talking about? Uh, they go, Andromeda. Right? Even then, I wasn't that curious. But a few days ago, Susan Lynn, you know Susan Lynn, she's always terribly kind in the comment section about these videos. But uh, And she has a channel of her own, obviously, which you should check out. But on her channel, she was interviewing a woman who apparently takes in messages from Andromedans. And I thought, maybe this is something I should look into. So I looked at pictures for Andromeda, the galaxy of Andromeda. It's that spiral one you can sometimes see in the sky. And at some point in the future, billions of years down the line, so clear your desk and get ready, <laughs> uh, billions of years away, uh, the two galaxies, ours, the Milky Way and uh, Andromeda, are going to collide. They will be one. But I thought, okay, I'll look at a picture of the uh, galaxy of Andromeda and see what I get. And when I did, there I am floating in space. That's me. And as I watched, space sort of folded around me, a bit like when you're making a Swiss roll. It started to fold in around me and over me. And as that happened, I could feel my composite molecules breaking apart in such a way that they began to merge with the rocks and stones and debris or whatever else is out there of space. I eventually was indistinguishable, because I was now in my composite elements, I was indistinguishable from rocks and debris. It felt like I was being pulled into the galaxy, the spiral of the galaxy, because I was already integrated into it. My particles were its particles. I was one with this whole thing which ties in with the water thing, actually, as being one with the whole thing. And all we got to do is surrender to it and agree that we are, and uh, we feel one with the whole as opposed to separate from it and alone. I thought that was interesting. Self-indulgent, maybe, but uh, interesting. Now, many of you, as I said, asked me to look at the relationship between Merrick Garland and the Federalist Society. He is a member of the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society is a very conservative association of lawyers that has tentacles spread out through like 200 law schools around the US. It was founded in 1982 and has a huge budget. I think somebody left it $1.6 billion last year to help get conservative judges onto the benches around America. And it's been very successful at that. I think six of the nine Supreme Court judges presently sitting are members of the Federalist Society, and so is Merrick Garland. And people are saying, look, the reason that Trump has not been indicted yet is because the Federalist Society, with their massive budget and resources and ties to everybody, is stopping that happening. Well, I don't know if that's true, but I thought I'll put the two side by side. Merrick Garland, there he is, and the Federalist Society and see what I got. And when I did, the Federalist Society, the little figure, the Federalist Society was lying on its stomach on a raised platform. Merrick Garland was walking by, not really paying much attention. But fascinatingly, the Federalist Society, a little figure, had extremely long rubbery arms that stretched towards Merrick Garland and kept on stretching and were flapping. Oh, Merrick, 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 come, we've got something for you to do, Merrick! 
That's what it felt like. It was almost like it was grasping, but from a distance. <laughs> gimme, 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 gimme. But Merrick Garland, to his credit, didn't succumb. He stayed out of reach of the grasping hands. There might be a lunch or a dinner or some other function where somebody sits at your table and goes, you know what should happen in this situation with the January the 6th committee? You know how Trump should be dealt with? And Merrick Garland, instead of going, no, tell me, I'm fascinated, would go, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, OK. And then go on his own way. He did seem incredibly independent. I was impressed by that. I could not, even though I tried to push him in the direction of where the Federalist Society was lying, I couldn't get him to concede. He just carried on on his own way. I'm not saying the Federalist Society is necessarily trying to sway his judgment, but uh, if it was, and that's what that meant, because I don't really know, but if that's what that meant, then uh, he was not willing to play that game. That's what it felt like. I also took a look at Trump and DeSantis. I think these are very early days for this, but Trump is firing his cannons across DeSantis's bows. He's making all kinds of derogatory comments about him, saying, I got that guy elected. You think without me, he's going to win in 24? Get over it. But he's also making rude comments. And the idea is he's going to try and make DeSantis out as the establishment figure, while Trump is the renegade, the rebel, who's trying to make America great again against all the odds. That's what it seemed like. So I put the two together side by side to see what might happen. There they are. And as soon as I did so, Trump started building a divider, a petition, hammering squares and bits of wood together, and he was pretty enthusiastic about this. He was hammering nails in, he was arranging wood, while DeSantis, on the other side of this barricade, was simply standing there going, what is he doing now? DeSantis seems to be a much cooler character. I know people go, well, he'll just be another Trump if he gets into power in 24. That's not necessarily true, because he's a smarter Trump, and he could be even more damaging to America than Trump was in his own way. But he seemed unfazed by whatever Donald Trump was doing. Donald Trump can't stop himself from fighting back or fighting. Whereas DeSantis bides his time. He doesn't have to respond. Stay out of the news, stay low. You've got a lot of problems, many of them legal in your own life without getting embroiled in that thing. So DeSantis approached a vehicle. Uh, it looked like a Star Wars land speeder, actually, but it was stuck on a rail. It wasn't freestanding. It was on a rail. He climbed into it and it launched forward. This must be his plan for 24. It goes along the wall. There's a big doorway. It goes out into sunlight and away. Now, if that means he doesn't run for president, then sure enough, he goes off and does something else. But if it's his presidential run and that's his plan, his campaign, it was very straight, very directed, very determined. It definitely had a set intention and direction to it. And that's where he was going. Whereas Trump was back there. Now he had his wall built and he threw paint over the wall. Then once it had dried, he started writing slogans on the wall. So it seems that Trump still is doing a kind of grifty campaign where he's trying to get money and um, is really biding his time going nowhere. Whereas DeSantis is paying no attention to that and uh, is on his rail in his little land speeder going in the direction of the election. If that's what that represents, it could be something else, but it certainly had a definite intention and uh, direction to it, backed by a single-minded determination to get where he needed to go. And finally, it's time for the results of the Diet Coke consciousness experiment. If you remember, two weeks ago, I poured Diet Coke into two jars from the same can. Diet Coke into two jars. On one of the jars, I put a label saying love and kindness and good health or whatever it was. And uh, on the other one, I put nothing. 
And over these past two weeks, I have directed loving vibes at the one with the little label on. I've shown it affection as much as you can to a jar of, of soda. But I have. Uh, now, some of you said, please don't keep it in your bedroom. Put it in the fridge. It'll go bad. Really? Diet Coke will go bad? <laughs> you mean go worse? Um, now, when I did pictures for Diet Coke to begin with, before this ever started, I found there were little lightning bolts over it, as if it wasn't terribly good for your system. But according to Dr. Imoto, even if something starts off with a negative vibe, by projecting love at it, you can change the vibe and make it positive. And I thought, let's try that with something that my pictures say is not good for me. So I will now go to the fridge and I will bring back the Diet Coke jars and we'll test them out right here. Ta-da! Here they are, the original Diet Coke jars. Uh, this one has the label on, and this one doesn't. So what I thought I'd do first is muscle test them, and then do pictures. When I did the muscle test originally for Diet Coke, I got a definite no. But uh, obviously things can change, so let's do the uh, non-love one. Oh no, that's a definite no. <laughs> no, you still cannot put that in your body. And now here is the one with the label on. Let's see about that. No. No, still the same. If it's got colouring and uh, preservatives and a bunch of other chemicals in it, then no, do not put that in your body, my fingers are saying. Okay, so now let's do pictures for this. I'm going to have to take the top off to do this. And uh, let's just see what uh, the pictures say. Oh, actually, yeah, that's very clear. You know, when you look at a mountain range in the morning, a very high like Swiss mountain range, and the clouds are rolling over the top of the peaks, that's the image. Grey clouds rolling in over the jar and filling it. I think we know by now that these cloud things represent contaminants or pollutants or pesticides or something and the fewer of them there are the less of a layer of them there are the healthier the product probably is uh, for you that's what they seem to be saying but now we have the one with the label on that i've been projecting love at every time i went to the fridge we'll see what effect that has and uh here we go i think different different finger this time <laughs> oh, that's interesting. There's still clouds. There's still clouds, but they are in a ring around the outside of the jar. Like, I don't think I would drink this still, because there are still things in it that are wrong for my body. But it seems like a bit of love has separated some of the negative energy from the positive energy and I mean to drink it you'd have to drink through the clouds but it's still different to the one without a label on oh isn't that interesting the one without a label blanket coverage clouds piling into the jar whereas with a label and with love and kindness um, the cloud cover is not as intense maybe that's the benefit of saying grace before a meal. That if there are things in the meal that you probably shouldn't be eating, that your body doesn't want, you are at least investing those ingredients with love and kindness and a certain amount of mercy <laughs> that may lighten the load when they go through your system. Maybe saying grace actually does have some benefit. Wow, that's amazing. As long as it's done sincerely and uh, in the right spirit. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Subscribe if you would. That'd be really helpful to the channel, as it would if you would like or share. Those would be terrific too. Follow me on Twitter, at Cash Peters. Follow Olive. <laughs> there she is. She's just asleep. These are her lazy days of winter. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I will see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.